going in chronological order, more or less. And um, our first speaker uh, today is Marilyn McCord Adams. She's a distinguished, excuse me, research professor at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, since uh, July 2009. And the title of her paper is Power Versus Laws, God and the Order of Nature in Aquinas, Scotus, and Occam. This paper is paying debts to Nancy. I promised her some references a couple of years ago at a dinner party, and I didn't bother to look them up until I wrote this paper. So consider yourself paid. For medieval Aristotelians, it was uncontroversial that the world exhibits non-trivial regularities. They found it evident a priori to count as a universe the world cannot consist of a heap of things, but must be essentially ordered by hierarchies of excellence and dependence. Likewise, they took it to be empirically obvious that the world is structured by always or for the most part regularities in the starry heavens above and in the sublunary world here below. In what follows, I will show how Aquinas, Scotus, and Occam followed Aristotle in explaining natural agency in terms of internal formal functional principles or causal powers. In their treatises on physics, they do not reach for natural laws. The order of the universe is more complicated, however, because natural agency is not the only contributor. God, the ultimate explainer, is an omnipotent voluntary agent who governs the world by a variety of laws and policies and orders it to, the end, to an end. Their story about how the different explainers relate to one another is distinctive and sometimes surprising. Aquinas on powers and explanation. Both as a philosopher and theologian, Aquinas' thought is shaped by explanatory programs. Strictly speaking, natural philosophy has to do with changing things. Aristotelian physics and biology begin with observed functional patterns and things here below. Aristotle applies his definitional axiom, what happens always or for the most part does not happen by chance, to conclude that functional regularity must have an explanation. There must be something in nature or some aspect of the way things are that explains such quasi-uniformity. Theoretically, Aristotelian natural philosophers are opposed to what they took to be Plato's approach, which makes the explanatory entities, platonic forms, to be separate from the things that engage in the functions. No, Aristotle declares, the essences of things here below cannot exist separately from the things they are essences of. Where changing things are concerned, Aristotle insists, natures are inward principles of motion. Thus, the first move of Aristotelian natural philosophers is from quasi-uniform functioning to positing formal functional principles, ratio formalis agendi or principium agendi, or forms in the substances that do so function. These forms either are powers, or they necessarily emanate the powers. Aquinas uses hydraulic imagery, as well as static structures that are necessary for exercising the functions. Thus, because fire always, or for the most part, heats, there must be in it a formal principle of heating, which necessarily emanates the quality of heat, which is calefactive power. Cows have digestion as an essential function. Therefore, there must be in the cow a formal principle of digestion, which either is digestive power or necessarily emanates the static structures or organs needed for digestion and floods them with digestive powers as accidents. The formal principles and or the powers are explanatory principles posited in the functioning thing to explain its quasi-regularities. Where functions always or for the most part travel together, their formal functional principles are seen to constitute a nature. The scientist's job is to sort through the variety of functional principles to discover root functional principles from which the genus and differentia are taken. The genus and differentia constitute the core of the nature because they explain why the other functions and characteristics are there. It is in order to function as a rational animal that humans have the static structures, the organic body, and dynamic functional principles vital, sensory, and intellectual that they do. Aristotelian functional reasoning has the vices of its virtues. It keeps explanation down to earth insofar as it posits explainers in the functioning things. 
but by the same token, it atomizes explanation so as not to provide any account of coordination among different things. The formal functional principles of fire explain its capacity to heat nearby heatables. The formal functional principles of water explain its capacity to be heated. But neither the formal functional principles of fire nor the formal functional principles of water, separately or together, explain how the water comes to be nearby the fire. Things here below may have powers, but nothing will happen unless agent and patient get together. In general, Aristotle's strategy in physics and biology is to begin with functional principles here below and then posit functional principles in the heavens and other superlunary things to fill the explanatory gaps. This method is thoroughly integrated into Aquinas' picture of the world and comes out explicitly in his treatment of the human soul. Animals exhibit vital functions. The formal functional principle posited to explain them is called the soul. Since vital functions are essential to animals, the soul must be their substantial form. Because both understanding and sensation are essential functions of human beings, the human soul must be the formal principle of each and both, organizing the bodily structures and emanating the powers needed for each. Averroes' view that the intellectual power is lodged in a transcendent intellect and that humans understand only when they couple with it is impossible because the formal functional principle of a thing's essential actions must be its own form. Aquinas is so convinced of the Arist Aristotelian conclusion that things here below essentially include inward principles of motion for their own essential functions that when he comes to consider a form of occasionalism that he attributes to the Moors, according to which fire doesn't heat, but God has instituted that God would never cause heat unless fire is brought close, Aquinas protests, quote, if natural things don't act, their forms and natural powers would have been conferred in vain. Evidently, it doesn't occur to Aquinas that the Moors might think that things here below didn't have any natural powers because Aristotle has convinced Aquinas that essential functions and hence formal functional principles are required for anything to be a thing. God is an explanatory posit. Cosmological arguments rest on philosophical theories of explanation that identify explananda, indicate how strong the demand for explanation is, and specify what it would take to be an explainer. Aquinas' five ways look to features of the cosmos as a whole, the call out for explanation, and yet could not be explained by the formal functional principles of sublunary beings. Why is there any change here below rather than none at all? The first way. Why there is something rather than nothing? The second and third ways. Why there is excellence in varying degrees? The fourth way. Why anything is ordered to an end the best way? The fifth way. The arguments conclude to an ultimate explainer, which must have or be whatever formal functional principle or power it takes to explain the phenomena. Just as the soul is the formal functional principle posited to explain human intellectualizing, and just as reflection on the function of intellectualizing brings Aquinas to the further characterization of the intellectual soul as incorporeal and subsisting, so God is an explanatory posit. From the second and third ways, Aquinas concludes that God is self-explanatory with respect to God's own being, necessarily exists through God's self, and his power to produce and conserve everything else that exists. The first and fourth yield the conclusion that God must be self-activating power to activate the causal powers of everything else, and a regular, always or for the most part, activator of them. Likewise, the fourth way yields the conclusion that God is self-explanatory and paradigmatic excellence. In the Summa Theologica, Aquinas famously conflates the conclusions of his arguments to compound a root notion of the ultimate explainer as a being that lacks all potentiality or a being that is all perfection per se. He then uses these root conceptions to infer a fuller characterization. The God is simple, perfect, good, infinite, immutable, eternal, one, all-knowing, just, merciful, and omnipotent. Aquinas concludes that the divine essence as simple is omnipotence, and is the formal functional principle that underwrites everything that God does or could do. Of course, what one can infer from pure act or pure perfection was and is philosophically contentious. Aquinas awards God omnipotence, roughly active power to bring about whatever is possible absolutely, but what is possible absolutely? Aquinas is explicit 
that it does not include power to make contradictories true because that is not really something to do. For humans not to be rational or for a triangle not to have three sides is not possible absolutely because the subject contains the opposite of the predicate. Avicenna and Averroes mounted metaphysical arguments that the first cause was an immediate cause of only one effect and produced other things only me immediately by acting together with prior effects. Moreover, they thought that the first cause acted by natural necessity to the limit of its power. By contrast, Aquinas understood God to be a voluntary agent from the fourth and fifth ways and took divine omnipotence to include power for solo divine action. Whatever God can bring about with acting together uh, with a created cause, God can produce all by God's self. Aquinas held, following Pseudo-Dionysius, that goodness is by nature a positive tendency to share itself out and concluded that since causal activity is an excellence, indeed the point of having a causal power, God would, for the most part, refrain from solo divine action. On the other hand, cosmological reasoning works only because solo created action is not possible. What happens here below, for the most part, involves both divine and created causes cooperating. Aquinas takes a further step to claim that God does not cooperate as immediate, but as an immediate cause. He declares that God is within each created thing as a co-cause alongside the created power. Aquinas explains this divine action within and alongside in terms of three causal contributions. God is the source of being, creates, a, creates the created causal power. Um, for example, not only is God the cause of Beulah's and Ferdinand's bovine reproductive power, God explains why bovinity exists at all and God conserves it in existence, while, as, while God as unmoved mover activates the created causal power or applies it to its action. In this sense, God works within and alongside the created causal power, enabling it to act. Alternatively, Aquinas says that created causal powers are instruments of divine power, analogous to the way that the saw is an instrument of the carpenter in cutting wood. When Elsie the cow is produced in existence, God causes the being, the Essa of Elsie, but God uses the reproductive powers of Beulah the cow and Ferdinand the bull as instruments of Elsie's coming to be, Fieri. Aquinas on voluntary agency, a law-governed universe. Aquinas contends that God is the ultimate explainer, not only of change and being, but also of goodness. As such, God turns out to be a voluntary agent that acts through intellect and will. Aquinas calls Aristotle as his witness against ancient philosophers who think that the world as we know it can be sufficiently explained in terms of efficient and material causes. Aristotle replies that efficient and material causes can explain the being of an effect, but not the goodness of an effect. For example, the fire and heat can explain the destruction of the nearby combustible, say the reduction of wood to ashes. But destruction is not a good or fitting thing unless it is ordered to some end. Sublunary things in general are such that causal activity by one is apt to produce some defect in another. Nevertheless, Aquinas insists, with Aristotelian optimism, that in the world as we know it, things are always, or for the most part, done fittingly and well. By A1, what happens always, or for the most part, does not happen by chance. Rather, if things are mostly apt and, or useful, it is because they are ordered to an end. But Aquinas maintains, what lacks cognition cannot tend to an end without being ordered to an end by someone who has cognition. Aquinas concludes that the world must be governed by provident, the providence of an intellect that introduces into nature an order to what is best, indeed that orders things here below to the ultimate end, namely God, the best way. Now college freshmen regularly join ancient and modern materialists to problematize such design arguments. Aquinas is nevertheless undeterred. Regarding his conclusion as secure, he proceeds to, divine provident, to define providence as God's cognition of things in the world qua ordered to an end. Aquinas insists that divine providence is comprehensive, extending not only to all created kinds, but to each and every individual. Just as within an army one can distinguish the order of soldiers to one another from the order of the whole to the duke or prince, so in the world one should distinguish the order of creatures to one another and the order of the whole to their end or first cause. 
If each creatable natural kind is inchoately aimed at God insofar as each creatable kind is at metaphysical bottom a way of imperfectly imitating the divine essence, providence orders each